All right, gang, I have Ryan Monahan, one of our FDN practitioner, medical lab expert, everything I go to for advice as well as helping investigate what is going on with myself <laughs> so I can help mm -hmm. other people. But Ryan Monahan, we did a podcast a year or two ago about mold. Yeah. Right. And so I wanted Ryan to come back on the show because we've been talking about hair mineral, hair tissue mineral analysis. We did a month or so ago on me and we did a podcast on that. And I found it really interesting. I thought it'd be great to share with our audience because endurance athletes trying to be fit and healthy, a lot of them are struggling, I think, to get results and pushing themselves too hard and really not looking at the whole picture, as I call the holistic method coaching program, looking at their exercise and nutrition, but also their lifestyle habits or sleep and their stress management. But also what we do as FDN practitioners, really a health investigator, looking at functional lab tests, multiple and looking at the whole picture. So Brian's on the show to help us kind of dive into some interesting information, how we correlate and how we work as FDM practitioners, as with the HTMA, a Dutch test, a GI test, blood chemistry, and really look at the patterns that we see and how we work to figure out a personalized program for a client. So we're going to use me as an example because I give permission to <laughs> talk about myself on the show. So Ryan... How do you think athletes can help improve their performance in life and their sport, but also taking care of their future self? Well, it's a, it's something that I think anyone could in the in our population could benefit benefit from, but uh, especially athletes, just given that they're trying to optimize their peak performance. And looking at a thorough lab investigation gives us an opportunity to kind of look under the hood and investigate the engine and really see what's going on at the cellular level in terms of our nutrient levels, our hormones, um, mineral levels, also factors that might be inhibiting optimal function. So these are things we know, you and I, Debbie, in the FDN world, we call these hidden stressors. So these yeah. are things like infections, toxins, blood sugar dysregulation, hormone imbalances, the list goes on and on, right? These, these are often things where many of us can go on living totally unaware of, right? Um, because we're not necessarily tuned in or connected to what's going on underneath the surface. Even if we feel like we're performing at our best, we're not always the best, most objective judges of what's going on with our own health, right? It's like, I say this all the time that the last thing a fish would ever notice is water, right? So- mm -hmm. So sometimes we're not even the most, you know, objective um, judges of, of what's going on with, with the picture of our health. And the lab testing, I feel it, it depersonalizes the whole situation because it's no longer about your opinion. <laughs> it's about what the, what the labs are saying to us. Um, and there have been dozens of instances, instances, and I'm sure you've experienced the same thing working with clients where they they come to you just wanting to be proactive and optimize and then you come to find that there's all kinds of problems when you peer underneath the hood and mm -hmm. as you know as we work through those issues we might actually find that we weren't at our peak we weren't at 100% the way we thought we did right and so through through this kind of comprehensive analysis and this comprehensive holistic approach as you call it um, we end up reaching a whole nother level of plateau uh, in terms of our well-being, uh, whether that's our energy levels, our focus, our performance, our mood, right? And, yeah. and suddenly maybe we were at 70%. Now we're at 90, 95, 100%, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's why I say, you know, so many people struggle to get the desired results, if they're trying to lose weight, get stronger, get faster, you know, just improve their general performance in their sports, but they're doing all the air quotes, right? Things that they hear about on other podcasts, social media, they're, you know, doing strict carnivore animal-based diet, they're doing keto, and they're still having 
issues and it's backfiring for them or their other end, they're not eating at all. They're doing extreme fasting because they hear mm. that for cell autophagy and mm. to prove their detoxification and stem cell and growth hormone. And I think we need to, I try on this show to go, okay, but you're an endurance athlete, you're exercising regularly. <laughs> so do you need to do all that fasting? Do you need to do a strict mm. carnivore? Do you need to do a keto type of flex plan? And and figure that out because there isn't one size fits all as we reveal when we do the functional lab testing and correlate that all together. Right. So I think people, mm. you know, try to do all this, but they're like, oh, I'm still not losing weight or I'm still not getting faster or, you know, my recovery is really crappy. <laughs> they don't really, like you said, we say, oh, as you know, it's an analogy of the car. How are you needing to get a tune up and overhaul the engine? Are you missing some parts and maybe mm -hmm. need some spark plugs and <laughs> yeah. give a little oil change to your body. And I think it's so important to invest in your health. Cause a lot of people, I always laugh, don't want to spend the money because it does cost them maybe some lab testing, but at least start with a general assessment of let's look at what you're doing and look at your nutrition, look at your plan you're currently doing and assess that to start. But I think a lot of it is, you know, that N equals one and looking at how do you feel and, you know, looking at metabolic typing and look at how you react to foods afterwards and paying attention to how you feel. So it's kind of teaching people to be more intuitive and aware. Oh, I have gas. I have bloating. I have fatigue after I eat, or I have a headache. I mean, there's a lot of free things you can do if you don't have the money to spend on labs, but I'll finish up. I didn't get to my point was a lot of athletes will drop $10,000 on a bicycle for racing or triathlon gear or spending money on race registration fees, but they don't want to spend a couple thousand dollars on functional lab tests that can actually enhance <laughs> their performance and their aging process. And hopefully do that for the long term, right? It's it's one of the yeah. best investments you can make in into your health is is really running a comprehensive lab analysis and seeing exactly what's going on under the hood. And just like you had said, you know, we might be lured into thinking that a ketogenic diet or carnivore diet or, or AIP or whatever it is, right? There's all kinds of different therapeutic dietary approaches. And um, a lot of these can be uh, really alluring uh, when we're following our favorite kind of influencers on social media. But uh, maybe when we're looking at the actual labs, it's telling us a different story that maybe that dietary approach you're following is, isn't is necessarily the best approach for your unique physiology and your bio individuality, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So again, Digestion. kind of that idea of letting the lab speak for themselves, having some objective outside data and uh, just letting that kind of the, all the swirling of opinions in your head, right? That, that so many of us have, like have so many clients that come to me not knowing what to believe. And so a lot of it is just guessing. This is playing whack-a-mole. Maybe this diet will work. Let me try that. Um, but yeah, th there have been plenty of cases where I'll, I'll see what I, what the labs are telling me is this this dietary approach or your exercise regimen is not working for you. But like mm -hmm. specific specific examples, someone whose adrenals are super burned out and they're following a, a vigorous workout, you know, CrossFit high intensity interval training kind of style of workout or exercise when their adrenals are asking for more rest and healing and repair and a slow down, right. Mm -hmm. Then, then that's where we have to sort of reevaluate our mindset too, because maybe there's, maybe there's a story we're telling ourselves that we just have to push, push, push. Right. And where did that come from? Yeah. And, right. So, yeah. so there's layers to this too, you know, like where, where did this idea it's come from that therapy <laughs> going deep. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. You said it, right? So yeah, some you know, the mindset and uh, one's history of traumas and all this sort of thing, it, it's all connected. I find that when I'm working with clients too, that, you know, they'll come to me and they want their exercise program and do the nutrition lab testing. But then I, I, I always look at what's the why, what drives you, you know, why are you choosing that? And, and really you have to work with the mindset first. I said, you know, we're just going to go backwards and you're going to have these same issues again, if we don't deal mm -hmm. with looking, getting a little deeper and healing the layers of the onion off, get to more the root causes or triggers of when mm. you say like, want to go eat a bag of cookies or, 
you can't deal with that stress at work and you tend to quit everything or you get overwhelmed right. and there's a lot more that I find you end up being helping coaching people is, is being their a guide and support person, but also, you know, letting them pause and reflect on more than just what they're eating <laughs> and why. It's, yeah. It's that, it's that human aspect to what we do because, yeah, you know, we, we are humans and we're not perfect. And uh, yeah, if we don't, if we don't, sort of get the mind right. Like you said, we might just fall back into our old patterns. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the labs, when you are coaching people and as we do as FDM practitioners, we don't just do one lab, ideally, depending on the person's budget, but so what are your top labs that you think, you know, we talk about all the time ourselves, but what would you suggest people if they're looking at, I want to really improve my performance. I want to work on improving my longevity, my aging process and be the best version of myself. What do you find works best to kind of get a picture of what's going on right now under the hood? So yeah, when, whenever I have an initial discussion about this with a client that might be interested in working with me, I'll start off with this sort of analogy that let's, let's kind of pretend for a moment we go on Amazon and we order a puzzle. And that puzzle box, it comes in the mail, but the, the, the picture is not on the front. So we don't, we don't know what it is yet. We, but we open up the box and there's just one puzzle piece in that box. So I look at that one puzzle piece and I'm kind of scratching my head. I'm trying to determine what this actual image is. And I can't tell. I can't tell if it's a, a landscape or a bowl of fruit or mm -hmm. a vase of flowers or a bunny rabbit or a train. I have no idea right? Because I just have one puzzle piece. So I need all those puzzle pieces in order to see the full picture. And that's very much what it's like to run a comprehensive lab investigation. So another way I'll frame this to clients, I'll say, if you want me to build you a house, I need some bricks. And if we're, if we're Mason workers, then those labs, those are our bricks for you and I. And each one of those puzzle pieces or bricks, it reveals a new aspect of the healing picture. One lab might give us an insight into hormones, another into minerals, another into gut health, another into liver health, another into toxin exposure. So someone might ask, well, why, why is there not just one test that can, to rule them all, <laughs> that can show us all of this stuff? This is, it's, not, it's just not the way it is. And I, I would say one of the reasons is because different labs, you know, they, they specialize in these different areas over the years. And different forms of collection, whether it be stool, urine, blood, saliva, hair, they're all providing uh, different insights that are unique to that collection method, right? So th there's just no, there's no one way we can get all the lab information we need from one place. We need all these different perspectives. Um, but once we have um, a body of lab work to work with, then the picture becomes clearer and clearer as we go along and we're able to see how all the dots are connecting and start to see, I think of them as like themes. And what is the main, what are the major themes for this person? Maybe yeah. it's just something simple like chronic mental and emotional stress or job related stress. And that's, that's taxing the adrenals. And because that's taxing the adrenals, it's causing some other mineral imbalances or hormone imbalances over here. And all that, that stress can also suppress the immune system. Now, if the immune system is suppressed, then we're going to become more immune compromised. We're going to become more vulnerable to pathogens, right? So now that's where we end up with things like H. pylori, bacterial dysbiosis, yeast and candida, parasites. So you, you could see how the dominoes fall. And that's just one very simple example, but that's just something starting with someone who's living with chronic stress compromised adrenals, compromised immune function, being more vulnerable to pathogens. Those pathogens now are a source of chronic inflammation in the body. And that inflammation, mm -hmm. once it becomes chronic, is going to further suppress the immune system. And it becomes this like vicious circle. Right? Yeah. Um, but and again, brain inflammation too. <laughs> exactly. Every brain fog as I have. Always. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But that's why I like you, movies. you're yeah. so good at explaining You're much better analogies and your stories of them yeah. myself. So that's why I wanted you <laughs> to explain it. Cause you're so good at that. But 
You know, I think that's a such good information why people should invest in their health and your health is your wealth that you need to take action instead of just training for races all the time and working on improving your watts on your bike and your run speed, but really look at the whole athlete, as I say, with the, my eight elements that I coach people on, and then, you know, tie in these labs and really personalize a program because a lot of times people aren't aware of their symptoms. And we, as you said, all these hidden internal stressors might come up that people had no idea that they had because you're, you're normal. You've gotten used to how you feel and, and you might be kind of think you're thriving, but you could feel so much better and you have no clue that you have all this stuff going on inside of you. That's holding you back from being even more of a peak performer that if we can address these issues and deal with mm. that now, before it gets worse too, that you could be, you know, just coming up, you feel mm. like I'm pretty good. I don't have any symptoms. Then you find out all this hidden <laughs> stress is like, well, you're good is yeah. not your best. Do you want to feel your best? Or you just want to, you know, survive the day. I just had a thought that came to my mind, this idea of peak performance, <laughs> you know, what if it's equally important to be a, a peak relaxer? <laughs> right? Well, they say train hard, but recover harder. So that's kind of the yeah. thing is like thinking of it as like, train. I, I want to be the best person in the world at just chilling and relaxing mm -hmm. and, and, and giving my body rest and repair right? and getting, yeah. you know, being equally as competitive about that because yeah, the harder you push yourself, the, the more you need to, to rest and recover. It's equally yeah. important. And over exercise can be just as much of a stressor on the body as under exercise. And I think that fact is underappreciated. So mm -hmm. one classic example from our world is that you know over exercise can cause a lot of oxidative stress in the body. Yeah. And that oxidative stress drives cellular damage. That's essentially what oxidative stress is. It's a form of cellular damage. It's oxidation. Um, you know, leading to, there's a buildup of free radicals that are causing damage to the cells and the contents of our cells, even the, even the mitochondria and the DNA in our cells. And that can accelerate the aging process. <clears throat> you know, that that's kind of a, a, one of many of the the bigger concerns of overdoing it with exercise. Well, that kind of good segue into the topic that I could just chat out for hours with Ryan, cause he's so fun to talk to. <laughs> But I am on my 10 year anniversary of when my life changed. If people don't know my previous life, <laughs> I was a top Ironman performer in my age group and did Ironman Hawaii, I did 15 Ironmans and qualified five times for Ironman Hawaii. And I did Boston Marathon multiple years. And I uh, had a 312 as my best marathon in Boston and 317. And my half marathon times, I got to 135. I was doing 50K trail runs. I was super top of my shape, strongest I've ever been, fastest in 2012. And then boom, March, 2013, <laughs> I got ran over by a truck. I couldn't do anything. I had struggled on my bike rides. I would just hit me that I, I had no energy. And then that downhill spiral domino effect happened. So there is a reason to my passion, my purpose, my mission is to help you driven, ambitious, high charging athletes to avoid going through what I went through because there's, I'm not doing a marathon anymore. I'm not doing <laughs> long distance events because my body got burned out and broken. And it is that domino effect, as you said, you know, the immune system down from excessive stress from, for me, it was running my own business, my own fitness studio with, you know, huge rent every month and the pressure of that. And and just financial stress of never even getting paid and you have to run your business, but then there's the exercise, you know, I was training a ton. I was teaching classes too, but I was doing, you know, 20 hours a week of training probably. So then you have to look at this whole domino effect that we're talking about and that you have to change the way you live and how you show up to your day, how you start your day and how you end your day. And all that didn't really happen for me until thank you to COVID, that, that pandemic, that it was forced me to change my lifestyle. And so, but because of that, I want to get to the second half of our call today, talking about the HTMA and how that correlates with my uh, adrenal exhaustion background, HPA axis, which is really HPA slash gonads slash thyroid that I have this dysfunction. And 
you know, looking at a GI test and look at my blood chemistry, it is an ongoing journey. And until you really resolve where those stressors are coming from, not just the external stresses I did moving away from my life, but my hidden internal stressors that will come up. And if you don't resolve those and you don't figure out, you know, what keeps impacting your health, it's just this ongoing challenge. So we have to really stop, pause and reset and reboot the system and really look at from a holistic perspective as we do as coaches, as FDM practitioners slash investigators. So anything on that, Ryan, and let's kind of, I'd like to talk about the first thing, HTMA, the slow oxidizers after that versus fast mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. the way of living life as a race is my book is called life is not a race. It is a journey. What happens is the example of me with what we found in my HTMA versus labs and putting that together as a good example of what athletes can do when they're overtraining and have too much stress in their life. Well, you know, I'll just say your story really resonates with me. And my, my health crisis was about a little, just slightly before yours. Mine was 11 years ago. And so it was last year I celebrated my, my 10 year, I call it my hashi -versary. Oh. oh, that, that'd be, so, well, I'm not Hashis, but yeah, yeah, I'm right there. But, but kind of very similar story. I was just kind of pushing, pushing the limits of what I was capable of burning the candle at both ends. Um, just overworking myself, not getting enough sleep, not eating well. And that all came to bite me in the butt. Right. And I, I had that, that crisis where I often describe my life in two chapters, like everything before that event and everything after, because it really <laughs> did radically change everything for me. Um, and for nearly a decade leading up to that diagnosis, most of my twenties was spent experiencing chronic fatigue, brain fog, depression, debilitating allergies and asthma. And I, mm -hmm. I would have these sinus infections multiple times a year that I would have to take prednisone mm -hmm. for just to be able to breathe through my nose. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on, but, uh, I just, uh, very much wanted to say that I resonate and uh, empathize <laughs> with your story. <laughs> I five. I five yeah. That. Yeah. <sighs> I know, but I think that's why I, my mission this year is to share my story more often because I really didn't yeah. share it. I wrote my book, but I didn't do anything about it really right afterwards. It was mm -hmm. more my therapy to write the book, but then I still mm -hmm. was busy with my studio until this past year. It's like, you know, I see the, so many people breaking themselves down out there and overtraining and fasting yeah. too much, not eating enough, not getting their protein and healthy fats. And it's really shocking to me that how many people can survive that, but it, it is like you probably found yourself is I didn't just hit the wall 2013. It was, what was I doing? You know, all those red flags I somehow didn't see. Cause I thought I was doing amazing, being invincible, super charger, high performer that I could have prevented possibly what I went through. So I don't know. So that's mm. why I feel like people should invest in their health now, not get to how messed up I was when I found my labs getting help when I started to investigate. But anyways, mm. a good example of slow oxidizer, explain what a slow oxidizer versus fast oxidizer and a little mm. bit on that. Absolutely. Would it be helpful to give a little bit of context to the to the HTMA test or should we dive yeah. right into it? We can just yeah. a summary of it because people can go back and listen to Barton. We did a two-part okay, seminar perfect. or a podcast mm -hmm. on that sure. last month. So look back to upgraded formulas, Barton part one and two, and the video is best because we shared my lab test results from HTMA. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So that'll give a, a great foundation and background for your listeners. So just to give a very quick summary then, with, with a hair analysis, basically we're able to measure through a hair sample the levels or concentrations of these really critical minerals in our body at the cellular level, at the tissue level. The, the hair is a very good approximation of those mineral levels in the body, which is pretty cool. Um, and it gives us kind of a long-term picture over, say, like a three to five-month period because of the fact that our hair grows very slowly we're getting like almost like this archeological record of our mineral status in the body. So we could think of these minerals as performing like a countless number of, of metabolic functions. Sometimes we refer to them as like the spark plugs of the body, 
right? So especially minerals like magnesium and sodium and potassium, uh, sodium and potassium, right? The, we're, we're talking about the electrochemical potential of the body because these are electrically charged minerals. That's, that's where the term electrolyte comes from. So to your question, Debbie, the, just, that was just a tiny little background. Um, this slow oxidizer pattern is basically one where those electrolytes are really depleted, uh, especially relative to calcium and magnesium. Those two minerals tend to have a more calming or sedative effect on the body, whereas sodium and potassium are more energizing, more stimulating. Now, the balance between those four is of the greatest of, uh, importance on the entire HTMA test because mainly because they're the most abundant minerals in the body. So therefore they have a really strong effect on our metabolism, our physiology, our symptom presentation, right? So we need those minerals to be in balance to feel normal, basically experience normal, optimal function. Um, athletes are at greater risk for losing electrolytes because we sweat out a lot of sodium and potassium when we um, you know, work ourselves up to a sweat. Um, also those that are on a ketogenic diet, they're more likely to lose a lot of sodium. So these are just two populations you're probably working a lot with. Um, they're going to be at risk for uh, greater losses of sodium and potassium. And you're probably going to see a higher percentage of these folks with, with low levels. So a slow oxidizer, and let's kind of just look at that term for a minute. What does that mean? Because that term seems just like kind of far out. Oxidize, what is an oxidation rate oxidizer? And I'm going to just keep it really simple and just say the oxidation rate, I think of as the metabolic rate, the rate at which all of the processes that your cells are performing, like are they are they being performed at a nice, even tempo, like a, like a kind of even, even rate? Um, are those processes all over, you know, overly stimulated and wound up? That would be like a fast oxidative rate or with a slow oxidizer, which is the most common thing we see on the HTMA test. Um, that's where all the cellular processes are slowing down, right? So if your cells are sort of hypo functioning, then they're going to slow down like their production of energy and ATP, for example, or that electrochemical potential won't be there which is obviously like the most foundational thing to, to can, you know, contract and use your muscles. You're an athlete. So a slow oxidizer is someone who has very slow metabolic function at the cellular level and at the tissue level. And the main thing we want to do to correct that pattern is support those electrolytes with lots of sodium, lots of potassium, um, both in the diet and through supplementation. There are other things we could do to support a slow oxidizer. Like we want to support the adrenals usually because those slow oxidizers are usually going to have slow thyroid function and slow adrenal function. Um, so that's where we're going to want to think about things like vitamin C or vitamin B5 that can support the adrenals. Um, but also because this is important to mention, and I, I should have mentioned it earlier, but the majority of like, let, let's kind of address the question, why? Why are so yeah. many people in this slow oxidative state? Because I've had the opportunity and benefit of looking at hundreds, maybe over a thousand HTMAs. I would say at least 70, I'm being generous, conservative rather, maybe even 80% of the lab tests I look at are slow oxidizers. Mm. It's this very common pattern of, of, kind of either high calcium and magnesium and or low sodium and potassium. So Dr. Lawrence Wilson, he was like one of the original OGs, like one of the founding fathers of the HTMA test itself. I think he still sits on the board for analytic research labs, the lab that runs one of the more popular HTMA tests. And he says, when you're in a slow metabolic state, this kind of, we could also call it a parasympathetic dominant state. Well, normally we associate being parasympathetic dominant with rest and digest with like a calm nervous system state. But he says that this is not a normal state to be in. It's rather, it's an adaptation to years and years and years of chronic stress that have led to this mineral imbalance 
in to some extent your body has created this imbalance to force you to to say hey slow down it's time to, to heal and relax and repair let's repair these wounds that you've accumulated over the years whether that's mental and emotional or physiological right um so i just wanted to make that point that because if we're not addressing the underlying stress that led to this imbalance we're very likely just to end up right back where we started, which we talked about a little bit earlier with the mental and emotional stuff. So that's going to be a critical part of the picture with a slow oxidizer is, is getting them to identify the need to focus on stress reduction and incorporate more rest and think about things like massage, Epsom salt baths, acupuncture, and uh, you know, yeah. so on and so on, gratitude, and things that are going to put us in a, in that healing state. Right. So, yep. um, and I think that mostly answers the question about slow oxidizers. They're, they're in need of rest and repair. And they're also in, in need of supporting the adrenals and the thyroid and uh, lots and lots of electrolytes to kind of bring things back online. It's like, I say the slow oxidizer is like someone who ripped the spark plugs out of their engine. They've got no spark yeah. plugs. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's looking at, I find it fascinating how it correlates with everything else that, okay, you just said it's related to low sluggish thyroid and low adrenals. Mm -hmm. So what if someone just does a blood chemistry panel and they have, you know, low thyroid and maybe they do a, a Dutch test and they, well, most people don't do that, but typically people more popular would be blood tests with their doctor and their low thyroid and they take thyroid medication. Mm -hmm. And they don't really look at that. Okay. Why is my mm -hmm. thyroid low? And so many other factors that go in with the conversion of T4 to active T3 and the liver and then the gut health, but how the hair tissue mineral analysis gives this clue that there's something going on with the thyroid and with the adrenals. So that's why mm -hmm. I just, I always find it fascinating to really collect these clues as an indication to looking at something else as well and putting it all together. Really great so question. And I feel like that's one I'm pretty equipped to answer as someone with a thyroid, you know, history of Hashimoto's myself. And that that's one of the primary populations I work with is clients with hypothyroidism and then Hashimoto's. So I'll give you a specific example that I see a lot and I'll keep this more brief, but I see yeah. a lot of clients that have been on thyroid medication for years and it you know, got them 30, 50% better, but they're still hitting a wall with their symptoms. They're still feeling brain fog and fatigue and weight gain, constipation, uh, weight loss resistance, a lot of these things that are common with slow thyroid function. And they're like, why, why am I still not feeling better? Like I run my thyroid labs with my doctor twice a year and everything looks quote unquote normal, maybe even from a functional perspective. Right? So the, what they're maybe very likely missing is the mineral piece. So one thing that's extremely important for the way your body handles thyroid hormone is your, is actually your potassium levels. One of those four macro minerals we talked about. It's one of the most abundant minerals in the body. We need about 5,000 milligrams of it a day, which by the way, most of us aren't even getting more than a third of that, right? That's and a whole it's other super hard story. to get it. <laughs> it's, it's challenging, right? Yeah. So, but the important thing about potassium is it helps our cells receive and take in that thyroid hormone. So here's what I'm getting at. See this all the time. Clients, thyroid labs are all perfectly normal in range, but then we run the HTMA and their potassium levels are critically low. Like we want to see on the HTMA, the potassium may be between, I don't know, roughly like an eight to a 15, right? But I see all the time where potassium levels that are, are at like a one or a two or a three. Well, like, I'm looking at mine. My yeah. calcium is 207 and potassium is a four. So, yeah. Four is pretty low. Pretty low. We want to <laughs> see that like ideally at like a 10, right? Or a yeah. little higher. So a lot of room for improvement there. But basically to pull this all together, your thyroid levels could be totally normal in your blood, but without enough potassium, your cells, it's almost like having like a weak cell phone signal, right? I have my phone on my desk, right? It's like the other person 
calling you, they've got five bars on their phone. So their signal's really good, but I'm on the receiving end and I've got a very weak signal. So I still can't hear what they're saying. Right. So gave you one of my classic analogies there. <laughs> I was so, say, there's another one. <laughs> there's another one. So yeah, without that potassium, um, you can have all the thyroid hormones circulating in your blood, but your, your body won't be able to use it very well. So again, I, I often like to say that potassium, in my opinion, is maybe the most underrated nutrient for thyroid health. Hmm. Yeah. And I think no one really thinks of it. I, I pulled up some charts of where to get thyroid. I mean, thyroid potassium foods. And yep. I think a lot of people avoid those foods, especially if they're yeah. trying to do of a keto carnivore, you know, to eat potatoes. Oh my yep. gosh. It's a carb, you know, it's, it's so funny. Potatoes, how we sweet potatoes, carrots, okay, parsnips, celery. Yeah. Um, but also um, avocados are very high. Salmon is very yep. high. Um, so th there are ways to do it if you if you're really trying to maintain that more ketogenic diet. Yeah, beet greens. Here's my list. Beet greens are 28. percent Those are 13, 1,309 milligrams mm. cooked. But who eats beet greens? <laughs> <laughs> Not many um, people. Avocados are 975 milligrams. Salmon is 1,068. Mm -hmm. And then potatoes are 926. So rest of potatoes. Yep. Acorn squash, white button mushrooms, and then there's tomato and bananas and milk, but I don't do those myself. But anyway, I think salmon is just looking at what foods you can have that to add in potassium. And then, you know, I've been doing my liquid drinks that have all my nutrients in it too, but I just wanted to share the that analogy that you have and just how important it is to look at our minerals as well as your blood work, but also, you know, looking at your gut health is, I just can't do someone's investigation without knowing what else has gone on in the gut that's causing all this kind of different metabolic chaos. I think it gives us so many clues to correlate with the mineral tests and the blood test. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and there, there can even be some additional insights you can get from an HTMA. I would say a better word is clues. So yeah. for example, if you see very high cobalt levels, that can be a really strong indication that the liver is backed up, the liver is congested. Mm -hmm. So then the, the, the question as to well, what's causing the liver congestion, then yeah. you're going to have to dig in and look at some other labs to find out what's causing that. And it could be a range of reasons the client's drinking too much alcohol, diet high in refined carbohydrates or sugars, maybe a lot of toxin exposure, you know, due to like someone's occupation, maybe they have heavy metal fillings, right? So there, there can be lots of things going on there too. So mm. um, yeah, th there's a whole, there's a whole like world to the HTMA in and of itself. And that if you're, if you have a really trained eye, you can potentially identify other kinds of hidden patterns that might be going on. Yeah. And, but you don't just do that test by itself. You do it with other tests. A hundred percent. Yep. Going right back to that puzzle analogy. Yeah. So typically when I'm working with a client over a longer period of time, <clears throat> excuse me, say like six months, I'm usually looking at a GI map, an organic acid test, some blood chemistry, the, the HTMA I run on every single client, no matter what. Um, sometimes I'm running some food sensitivity tests. Like I really like the vibrant wellness zoomers. So really whatever it takes to get the job done. Um, you know, usually with those sort of foundational labs, we're able to see most of what we need to see, but there are cases where we go, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something going on here where we need to deepen or broaden the investigation. You know, let's say that maybe something like Lyme disease or SIBO or mold, you know, things that um, aren't necessarily common to every person, but we're seeing enough evidence and through their history and through the labs that we might need to kind of keep digging. Right. And that's, that's what it's all about. It's like digging until you strike gold, until you find the answers you're looking for, because bringing this full circle, like it is my, this whole thing would fall apart if I didn't have this foundational belief that, and that foundational belief is that symptoms don't happen randomly. They don't happen in a vacuum. There's always a cause. Like, I believe we live in a logical universe, <laughs> right? 
where long gone are the days where I, I don't know, I just have diabetes because I guess my mom yeah. and dad had it, right? That's just so out- antiquated and outdated that that kind of genetic deterministic view that there was nothing I could have done. Well, it's maybe it wasn't a genetic predisposition, but it was because of the the environmental uh, fact, you know, the, the fact that you grew up eating pasta every night with mom and dad. Now, that has nothing to do with genetics. That's that's habitual. That's environmental. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I really do fundamentally believe that any condition or diagnosis, no matter how complex, it has a cause behind it. And if we mm-hmm. can identify it, call me an optimist, but I think we could just about resolve uh, or reverse anything. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm and I'm not using the word cure here because you know, like with an autoimmune disease, you can never, you know, technically, you can never cure an autoimmune disease, but you can you can manage it. You can put it in a remission if you even want to use that word. Um, you can get to a point where, like I have, where I've gotten my antibodies back down into a remission range and I'm totally asymptomatic. So yeah. the fact that I technically still have Hashimoto's because it's an autoimmune disease and the immune system has this B cell memory and all that, um, it, it doesn't even bother me anymore. I don't care, you know, because mm-hmm. as, as far as I'm concerned, I'm I'm totally happy and healthy and asymptomatic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ryan, we are out of time and I know people might want to get a hold of you. You specialize, yeah. your clientele is more Hashimoto's, Lyme. What's your favorite kind of area that you work in? Yeah, thyroid, thyroid issues, issues are probably number one. Second to that would be mold issues. I work with a lot of clients with uh, mold illness. That's an, another um, thing that I've, I've unfortunately <laughs> had to live through that I have a lot of experience with. Um, so, but, you know, a whole range of things, just fatigue, weight gain, um, really, if you're, if you're applying these sound principles and you're running a thorough lab investigation, you, you can help anybody. Um, if you, yeah. if you're really focusing on not the symptoms, but actually the, the, all the dysfunction that's going on underneath, that's the stuff I'm interested in. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. And where people, how can they get a hold of you if they want to connect? Yeah. So my website is the mindful Nutrivore. And the same name on all my social media. So um, on Facebook, I'm the Mindful Nutrivore. On Instagram, I'm the Mindful Nutrivore. Feel free to hit me up, send me a direct message. Um, I, I always try to reply when I can. Good. Well, thanks so much for your wisdom and your analogies today and helping us explain kind of the FDN investigative process and how we work on putting the missing pieces of the puzzle together so people can feel, perform, and look their best in life and thrive every day instead of just get through it, struggle. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, Anytime. And thank you so much for having me on the show. Appreciate it.